How are we doing today? Happy Saturday, first of all. Good morning, good evening, all around the world. By the way, just want to let you guys know I will not have my webcam on the entire call just because you don't need to see my face when you need to see the slides. So we are only going to have my webcam on for moments like this. So you can see my face to start, but look what I've got. You guys see my webcam? You guys see these things? This is how tonight's call or today's call is going to go. We've got hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of $25 Amazon gift cards. Now these are gonna go to whoever wins on the spin wheel. And you can win multiple times. So if you win, you can win again. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna start the call. Let's do two of these. Um, also, I, ha I have a moderator, two moderators actually. So please, if they message you for any reason, listen to whatever they say. And they're gonna write down the winners. Look at these guys, here we go. Who wants to start the call with a bang and let's start by spinning the wheel. Put some ones in the chat. All right, this has got to be the biggest wheel that I've ever spun. Uh, I know Let's get this thing started, guys. I must admit, I am just stoked for this call. I will be turning off my webcam, just so you know. Not that um, you care about that. I just want you guys to have full screen on the slides. First question I have for you guys. Do you got one of these bad boys, one of these pens? You got a piece of paper? Now, this call is like a, it's like a hill. Ever, who's ever been skiing? You're on the ski lift and you get started on the bottom and you're going to the top of the hill. This call is like that. Meaning the, the beginning, some of you might think, man, didn't want to be motivated. By the end, it's super tactical. The beginning is super general. The end is super tactical. It slowly ramps up. Keep that in mind throughout this call. First things first, guys, I'm going to turn my webcam off now, if you don't mind, so I can get really into the slides. First things first, for those of you guys that don't know me, my name is Patrick. I'm really excited to be with you today. I'll share a little bit about my story in a few minutes. And I do admit, I have quite literally nothing to sell you. Today is all about you guys. How many of you guys are excited to make 2024 that year for yourselves? The year where you achieve the goals that you've desired for years, maybe. The year where you accomplish all of the things you've been thinking about for so long. Today is about getting ready for that year. I'll tell you why today. Some of you guys might be thinking this is just a random Saturday. I did not pick today's date for any other reason than something specific that I'll share in a little bit. That is what today's call is about. It's about getting ready for the new year, but then putting in the work, the tips, the tricks, the tactics to make more money, but also manage it better. So if you stay till the end, you will know how to set goals properly in a way that you can achieve them and also in a way that actually pushes you to achieve them. How to manage budgets. For some of you, that word is the plague. It's not a word that you've tackled very much in your life. We're going to talk about tactically, not just, oh, here's a budget, how I do it. Number three, how to track your net worth and why this is so important for your financial goals. And talk about how to do it, what it is. Number four, we're going to talk about organizing LLCs. We're going to talk about getting in business. The things that I wish I knew, the things that I wish they taught me in college, the things that I wish I knew when I started my first LLC. Put a 222 in the chat if currently you have your name on at least one LLC. I want to know how many of you guys are in this boat. The people that are putting a two in the chat, this section will really pertain to, but if you're ever thinking about starting a business in the future, it's going to pertain to you as well. And number four, I'm going to talk about organizing bank accounts in a way so that you guys, no matter the country you're from, can think about the way you organize your money in a better way. We're also going to talk about investing. I made a bold claim the other day on an email I sent you guys. Not sure how many of you guys actually read the email. I said, if you stay, I will show you how... I can give you a 98% probability that you make money investing in the markets. If I said that, it sounds like clickbait. But today, 
I will prove to you that you have a 98% chance to make money in the markets. Not a lot of people know that. We're going to talk about that. How does this sound, guys? You sound like any of these bullet points you could use in your 2024. Now, as a disclaimer, everything I share today is simply my experience. It's my opinion. I am not a tax advisor, I'm not an attorney, not an investment advisor. Every single piece of information today is simply stuff that I've personally done. I'm sharing stories. So what that means is you can look at it, but still do your own due diligence. Talk with your own legal, accounting, tax, investment teams. But this is the stuff that I do. All right. With that said, everything in here is a story, meaning I'm not sharing generic BS information. I'm sharing what I've been able to accomplish in the last 10 years and really show an evolution of all the mistakes that I've made. This is basically, a if you think about this slide deck, it's a bunch of mistakes that I made and I'm showing you how to avoid them. This, if you do it right, is going to save you at least 50,000 in mistakes and at least five years in time. Now, before I begin, some of the people pictured in this are probably on this call today. Shout out to them. Just a quick backstory about me. I'm from a small town called Butte, Montana. In fact, I think I saw a few people on this call right now that are uh, from Butte, Montana on this call. So shout out to you guys. So I grew up in Butte, Montana. This is a town with 30,000 people. Median household income of... Now a little bit higher, a little over $40,000. Really, really amazing town. Hardworking people, mining town, blue collar town. How many of you guys are from small towns like that or can relate to that? Put a one, one, one in the chat. Point I'm trying to make guys is, I say this with good. There wasn't really a blueprint for me to follow in my town for me to accomplish the things that I've been able to accomplish in the last 10 years. There wasn't a person that was like, oh, you got to meet them and you're going to be able to do what you want to do. Listen, when I got out of high school, I knew one thing. It's funny. I don't know if my mom's on this call or not. She might be. But I always used to tell my mom, mom, I want to be rich. Not for the love of money, but for the opportunities that it gives. On the left side there, it's me and my dad at the Super Bowl last year. You know how cool it was to bring my dad to the Super Bowl in the bottom bowl, 10 rows up, an entire day experience. I can't do that stuff without money. My buddy's up top. I cannot go to San Diego and have the most amazing time without money. The house you see being built, I can't invest in that flip with some great people, eight of us, without money. I can't have that amazing, amazing Rudy. I'm not going to say what kind of car seat he's sitting in, but you can look at the emblem. I'll leave it at that. I can't have stuff like that without money. Is that true or true? And how many of you guys feel like if you had more money, you could do more good in the world? You could impact more people. Maybe you could give back. Maybe you could go buy hundreds of dollars worth of Amazon gift cards and share information for free that should be charged for. Guys, when you get money, it gives you more opportunity. But the reason I share all this with you guys is I'm just like you. When I started, I didn't know anything about finance. I didn't know anything about how to invest, risk management. I didn't know how to start an LLC. I didn't know what a write-off was. I didn't know how to do anything. And in short 10 years, we've been able to impact tens of thousands of lives around the world. Right now, there is people tuning in from over 25 countries on this call. And if a kid that's 27 years old from Butte, Montana, of 30,000 people can do it, I'm telling all of you right now, you can do it. So I just wanted to share briefly who I am, what I've done, hate talking about myself. But that hopefully gives you a little context of who I am. And again, I, I reiterate, I have nothing to sell you. Today is just information. 
just knowledge. Now, I ask you a question. Do you have people right now close to you in your sales teams, your family, your friends, your business workers, whoever it is, do you have people that you believe need to hear this message? I wasn't sure if this slide was going to be applicable, but it looks like it is. Guys, there's 441 of you on this call right now. That means that there is room for at 442 now. There's room for 58 people right now. If you have someone that you believe needs to hear this message, send them the link, learnfrompk.com right now via text. There's 57 now. It's going up as I speak. At 500, there's no more room. Get them on this call. Especially right now, let me tell you, there's one group of people. If you own a company or have a sales team, I'm telling you one thing, get them on this call. Text them and say, get on this call. I don't care what you're doing on a Saturday. Get them on this call. This is going to spark a conversation like no other when this get, gets over. You're going to have a team meeting and they're going to love it. Now, for the rest of you that don't have teams, all good. Your family, your friends, shoot them a message. Go to learnfrompk.com and get on this call. Learnfrompk.com. So here's the agenda for today. And again, if you have not put aside at least two hours, then you're not going to make it through this thing. This is going to be a good one. Our agenda is one, we're going to talk about goals. That's where I'm going to start. All about goals, how to set them, how to achieve them. Number two, we're going to start talking about budgeting. Number three, we're going to start talking about investing. Number four, we're going to get into stability in life. And number five, we're going to talk about organization. And for some of you, maybe your most valuable part will come at the end, which will be a Q&A panel using that Q&A bubble at the top, not the chat feature, where I'm going to be able to highlight certain questions and answer your questions live like never before. So with that said, without further ado, enough of the story, enough of the back. We are going to get into the first topic of today. Again, this is a five-topic call, which is goals. So to get started today, what is a goal? A goal is the end toward which effort is directed. Every one of us, whether we know it or not, written it down or not, has a goal. A goal might be physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, financially, a lot of different goals. But what's important in this type, uh, this time of year is that we get very intentional with what's important in our life, what we actually want to accomplish in 2024. Average people start thinking about this New Year's weekend. That's why this call is right now. Again, I'll share why this call is today in a minute. But the first thing we must do is figure out what we want. That's you. Right now, I want you to think, who are you? Audit yourself really quick. So you're going to grab a pen and paper, and I want you to write a smiley face on it. I want you to audit yourself for about... 30 seconds, and write down one word answers of yourself. Be honest with yourself. Happy, unhappy, healthy, unhealthy, wealthy, not wealthy. I want you to audit yourself really quick, where you're at. Gauge it, just really quick. Think of some words that would describe you. And all of you are on this trek. Would you agree? Every single one of us in life is trying to accomplish something new. And Today, I'm going to refer to it as the moon. You know, we always say shoot for the stars and shoot for the moon. Well, today we're shooting for the moon. A minute ago, I shared my story, and I can guarantee you one thing. I would not be living the life I'm living with the people I'm doing it with. Doing all the things that I've been able to accomplish, traveling, etc. If I didn't shoot for the moon. Now, that's what we're going to talk about today. We have to become really good, intentional, and I would just say overall great at defining what that moon is in our life. The moon is an acronym for your goal, if you're not picking up on that. How many of you guys would agree with this statement by one in the chat? If you're better at defining goals, you'll become better in life. The problem is there's a lot of people out there that are just not the best at defining their goals. It's funny. 
the people that say goals aren't the best thing. Oh, I don't worry about goals. I just kind of go through it. They never hit anything. It's a moving target. Now in college, I learned this acronym. I have my bachelor's degree in marketing, if you guys are wondering. I, I learned this acronym, SMART. Anybody heard of this? How many of you guys have heard of this acronym? I was taught with this great teacher, loved her. She was amazing, marketing teacher. She taught us this. And I, and I must say, at the time I bought into it, I loved it. It was on an exam. This is what it stands for, S-M-A-R-T. Write this down if you've never heard of it, or if you have, write it down again, because I promise I'm going to twist this thing different than you've ever heard. S stands for specific. M stands for measurable. A stands for attainable. R stands for results-oriented. And T stands for time-bound. I'm going to do it again because I know some of you guys are taking notes. S is specific. M is measurable. A is attainable. R is results-oriented. And T is time-bound. Now, let's talk about this. Let's unpack this for a minute. Now, I have an issue with this, and I, and I must say this issue developed a couple of years after I first learned this. I wanted to ask you guys a question. Do you think in 2014, I thought the life that I have now was attainable? A young 18-year-old out of high school, graduating high school. A lot of you guys are saying no, and I would agree with that. Heck, this stuff, some of the things that I've been able to accomplish, being blunt with you, I don't even think they were on the goal sheet because I thought that that was probably too much. The point is, we must X out attainable in our lives. What I mean by that, guys, is when you are looking at your goals, generally speaking, what we do is we write down our goals based off past accomplishments. What do I mean by that? Let's say you have a financial goal for a minute. You have a financial goal of making $80,000 a year. The reason you chose $80,000 a year is probably because you made, I don't know, 50. And so you look at 80 and think, man, it's, it's, it's more than I've ever made. It's a push, but your brain can comprehend it. You have to get really good at thinking outside of the box, per se, of what your current brain tells you. How many of you guys think that self-doubt and self-confidence limits your goal setting? Where you limit yourself based off of your past accomplishments? Today, what I want you to do is I want you to expand for a minute. I want you to just think a little bit bigger. If attainable was out of your dictionary, can you tell me what your goals would be? That's what we're going to spend a couple of moments talking about. So on a piece of paper, I want you to think about this as your piece of paper. I want you to start defining your goals, such as number one, you know, I want to make more money. Maybe that's a goal of yours. Number two, I want to travel more. So everybody right now, grab your pen and paper. And I told you guys, this is like a ski hill. We're ramping up slowly. Some of you are listening to this right now. You're like, man, I took my Saturday to listen to him talk about goals. Others are probably loving it. This will ramp up. But I want you to spend the next one minute. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to write down as many goals as you can. Or number two, grab your goal sheet that you already wrote down. Now, that's a big gold star war for you guys. And when you guys have 
goals on goals on goals on goals. Let me know in the chat box when you're ready to go. Now, in order to let me that you're ready to let me know that you're ready to go, all I want you to do is type the amount of goals that are on that sheet. That's all I want you to do. I don't you don't need to see ready. Just how many goals do you have on the sheet? That'll let me know that you're ready to go. And again, I'll give you about 60 seconds. All right, good job, guys. So everybody's typing them out. Give me a minute to erase all this. I want you guys now to share, if you feel comfortable doing it, an example of one of your goals. Everybody's got their goals down. Love it, love it, love it. Buy a house. 100,000 liquid. Love it. Explore the world with no limits. Make more money. Be well off. Okay, now, as you write these down and tell me how many you have, I want to do two things with you. First of all, I intentionally wrote the goals down the way that I just wrote them down to challenge you for a minute. So, you know, a minute ago I said I want to make more money. Remember that? Some of you guys said the same thing in the chat. Some of you guys just mentioned be well off, learn more. I want you to take this not in an offensive way. Those are absolutely terrible goals. Here's what I want you to start to learn to do. Instead of saying make more money, and I intentionally did it wrong at the beginning. What I want you to do is I want you to be very specific about this. I want to make $120,000 net income in 2024. That is specific. It's measurable. Forget about attainable. I don't care about that. It's results-oriented. And it's time-bound. You have to get good at being very specific about your goals. Somebody just said, I want to buy an island. Okay. Where's the island? What does it look like? Daniel Allen, you have my heart, my friend. You know you do too, if you follow me on social media. I want to be able to afford to eat Japanese A5 Wagyu once a week. I got to admit, from one steak guy to another, that's like not a good idea for your intestines. That's probably too much information. Wouldn't do it, wouldn't suggest but it's a great goal. Hit my first 100K. Again, at a time. Increase overall net worth by 10% in 2024. Trey, phenomenal goal. Now, again, a minute ago, I asked you guys a question. I said, how many goals do you have? Oops. And all of you guys shared a different amount of goal, a different amount. I'm going to share a story with you. I had, honestly, I had a really great experience in college. I know that the the media nowadays is creating sort of like a negative connotation towards college. And, and I understand why, because of how crazy it's gotten. So first of all, I want to preface this by saying, I was so fortunate to get scholarships and funding, as well as have my parents help me out with college. I want to start by saying that. So I don't recommend college to everybody, especially going into debt. But I'll share a story with you about college. I had this guy named J.J. Adams. He was one of our professors. He did some marketing stuff. And frankly, he was one of the only two professors that taught us that actually owned businesses. I think that's funny. The rest of my professors that were teaching me about business never owned one in their life. So I really respected what he said for obvious reasons. He owned a business. He's been there. And he actually worked in some big private equity stuff as well as on Capitol Hill. And he ended up having an opportunity to have lunch with guess who? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett taught him two things. One is irrelevant to goals, but I'll share it with you. And the other one is so relevant to goals. He ended up meeting him years ago. And what he told him was, number one, 
If you want to have a bigger impact in life, and then some of you guys can see this bleeding through with me right now. If you want to have a bigger impact in your life and you want to be more successful in life, go teach people. That's one of the first things that Warren Buffett shared with him. Go teach. Listen, this guy was making millions of dollars in his business. He put it all on the back burner to go make, what, 50000 a year probably, somewhere around that range, and teach us for two years. He said, go teach for two years. That's what he did. He went and taught. That was number one. Now, that's not relevant to your goals, but really important. But number two, a minute ago, I asked you guys about how many goals you had, and you all shared a different number. And the second thing, and Warren Buffett's been seen in podcasts saying this, the second thing that he taught him was to look at that goal sheet and circle less than five that are actually important to you right now. What do you actually want to accomplish in 2024? The point is, guys, so many people are goal happy. They've got 20, 25, 30, 40 goals. No. I need two, three, four, even one. I have one goal on my desk right now. We'll talk about that in a minute. All I have in 2024 is one freaking goal. The point is some people have 30, 40, 50, 60 goals. That's great. But one of them says, take my dog for more walks. Now, no offense, Rudy. Hope you're not listening, buddy. But if that's your biggest goal of 2024, we might be on the wrong call right now. We must determine and lock in on what we want in 2024 right now. So my point is, you have to write down the goals now that really matter in 2024. Not the ones that kind of matter. Not the ones you've written down the last five years, but you've never hit. What matters to you? You might say, man, I, I want to I wanna lose 25 pounds. Okay, then that's, is, is that the thing that matters? Great. Oh, I want to make 500,000 in gross commissions. Okay, is that the one thing that really matters? That is on your goal list. And you only have a few. Now, the reason I bring that up, guys, is the more I've learned and networked, with high net worth individuals and successful people and some people that have done some things that you couldn't even imagine. They're all so laser focused on just one thing. They have little stuff on the side here and there, but they are so focused on one thing. I cannot tell you the amount of people that I've seen that focus on too much. They want to help their church while also being on their fitness goal, while also building that business, while also traveling more. It's like, guys, we have to condense what we want in this year. So your first takeaway from today's call, which is admittedly the, the smallest takeaway, or at least should be, is condensing what matters in 2024. Put a one in the chat if you have that right now. What? What do you have right now? You've got that one goal or two or three, but no more than five. And that's pushing it. Now, I'm going to give you guys a sidewind or something real quick that I was taught. I, I'm a stress ball. Anybody that knows me knows that. I'm, I'm a stress ball. Mateo really knows that because I was stressing this morning about this call. I just, in general, inherent nature, I'm stressed every day. And I'll tell you one other piece of advice. This is not about goals, but I just want to share something that I'm getting good at, but not the best at. When you are stressed, I want you to write down, this is what I was taught, write down everything that's making you stressed right now. Now, when you do that, there might be five things, 10 things. This morning, I was stressed. One of the reasons was that I have this new $5,000 smart board across my office and we couldn't get it to work. And now I'm on a computer like any other Zoom. When this morning I was supposed to be with a stylist standing up a thing and we couldn't get it to work. That was stressing me out. Then I realized, oh, sit down, get on the computer. You'll be fine. Nobody will even notice unless you tell them, which I just did. 
But here's what you do. You write down everything that's making you stress. And guess what you do? You circle the things you can control and you cross out the rest. And what you'll find is the majority of the things that you're stressing about are the things that you can't control. You're stressed about your, your mom's health, not your own. You can control your own. You can't control mom's. You're stressed about your kids making the right decision. It's like, look, you brought them up, right? What, what can you control in that situation? So I know that's a sidewinder, but as much as goals, we're circling the things that matter on the stress side of things, because you're going to be stressed trying to hit these goals. You want to circle everything you can control and delete the rest. Now, I want you guys to put these goals somewhere now that you've written them down. And by the way, I'm calling you out. Some of you guys haven't done it. You're just sitting there. You're listening. I get it. And you've been stuck in the same spot for five years, too. It's amazing what happens when you start to implement things. But for the rest of you that actually write these things down, I want you to put it somewhere that you see it every day. Some examples are this. Phone screen. I'm going to share with you a story. I know there's people on this call that will know who I'm talking about. There's a really close friend of mine that wanted a specific watch. Ever since I met him, it was almost ever since I met him, it was his phone background. That was like the goal, one of the major goals of an item that he wanted. He had it as his phone background. He saw it every single day. And uh, 2020 or 2023 was able to sit down and watch him purchase it, the watch he'd always wanted. <clears throat> now, the reason I share this is that's a place you could put your goal list. It could be on your phone. Another example could be on the dash in your car on a sticky note. Another example could be on the mirror in uh, your, your bathroom on a sticky note. For me, mine's on a sticky note on my desk. I can see it right now. Literally, I just looked at it as I'm talking. I, on the left side, have one sticky note that I read every day. It says, I am talented. I am successful. I am loved. I am courageous. I am passionate. I am a winner. That's on the left sticky note. And on the right sticky note, I have my one goal that I dated when I wrote it down. And I have one goal. And it sits right there. And I see it every single day. See, the reason this is so important, guys, is it might seem easy to write down your goals. But then if you don't write them down, in three months, you might be sidetracked and your goal changes. It cannot be a moving target. You have to be keeping the main thing, the main thing in business and in life. And that is your one goal. So have it somewhere that you can see it. Guys, put a one in the chat so far. Are you gaining some value out of this? I know this is more mindset. We haven't even started yet, by the way. We haven't gotten to the real stuff. But are you getting some value out of this? Awesome. Now, I have a question for you. How many of you had a financial goal on the final like list or circled list, how many of you guys have a financial goal? And I know generally speaking, people follow me for on the finance side. You're definitely not following me for the bodybuilding side. And so I wanna talk for a minute, honing in on the financial side of your goals. So before we move on, I'm gonna ask you a question. Did you hit your financial goals in 2023? Yes or no? Not only will I share this recording via email with everybody that registered, but we have actually already shot a pre-recorded version of this that will be live on YouTube in the coming weeks. That's broken down into each section with specific information that you can rewatch. I'll say stuff that I didn't say today, and today I'm saying stuff I didn't say then. So all of you guys shared yes or no, you hit your financial goals. And I just want you to think about those goals for just a minute. That's all. And embrace the fact that some of you didn't hit it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a three-minute break. But before we actually know, we'll do it after. We're going to take a three-minute break. Okay? And when we come back, we're going to spin the wheel for more winners of Amazon gift cards. And then we're going to get into money, baby. The cheddar. 
So please, three minutes starts now. Go restroom, coffee refill, whatever you got to do. It's about to get good. Don't don't back out, by the way, because we're now maxed out at 500 people, baby. There's 500 people from glo- all around the globe on this call. You don't want to miss the good stuff. You're here for this stuff. See you in three minutes, guys. The call. So what I asked you guys before we broke was, did you hit any of your financial goals in 2023? And of course, there's a sporadic yes and no. Everybody had different answers for that. And what I want to start talking about next is your eyes on your money. I think that oftentimes when we train on money, it's just, oh, go make more money, go sell more, go do this, go do that. But what I want to teach you first is how can we be effective with what we do have? You know, something that um, I heard from a podcast from a gentleman by the name of Ed Milet, he said, if you can't handle five grand a month, what makes you believe you can handle 50 grand a month? And I think that that is so true. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. It's Let's talk about, to start, how do we handle what we've currently got? And then as we evolve, we'll talk about how to get more. And so that is topic number two, which is all about budgeting. How many of you guys' words, when you when you hear about budgeting, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind when you hear the word budgeting? You cringe. Okay. Buckets to sort. Required. Stress. You know, I was hoping some of you guys would say that because I think budgeting in general has like a a negative connotation. Budgeting doesn't necessarily mean that you're broke. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing something wrong. If you make a hundred grand a year, 30 grand a year, a hundred million a year, you should probably be still having some sort of budget so you know where your money's going. Because if you don't, keep your eyes on it, it's gone. It's like Houdini. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, here's why I told you I would mention this. I want to share a little bit why I chose to have today's call here. First of all, a statement for you. You have no clue how much momentum you're going to have in 2024 if you start your goals today. But here's why I started the call. What's the date today, guys? December what? Now, not counting today, how many full days are left in the year? Not counting today, 21. Okay, my next question is, studies have shown that it takes 21 days to form a what? A new habit. Today's call was not by accident Saturday the 9th. I did this intentionally. The goal for today's call is tomorrow you start your new year. Because if you do it and you stick to it, by January 1, you formed a new habit. Nothing on this call is by accident. It is today for a reason, meaning today is not the day to start. Today is the day to plan and tomorrow is the day to start. Now, someone just got stressed. Someone's like, oh, shit, I got to go to the gym tomorrow. But your goal is, if you can stick to your new, whatever you want to do in your new year that's really important to you, and you do it, by January 1, congratulations. By the way, would love to see you guys start it tomorrow and tag me on Instagram in your story. If you have an Instagram, my Instagram's on the bottom right corner there. I would love if you guys would tag me starting it, whether it's in the gym, whether it's a budget, whether it's whatever it is. I don't care what it is. So... With that said, how many of you guys have this? How many of you guys have an income? We're going to start today by talking about income. Income in Patrick terms is you make some money. It hits your bank account, the good ones. Everyone has to have some sort of income. Doesn't really matter where it's coming from. Some sort of income to survive, true or true. Now, the next slide, I'm going to show you some boxes. These boxes represent expenses. How many of you guys feel that over the last three years, your expenses has gone up? Put a one in the chat box. 
Now, yes or no in the chat, has your income matched your increase? Yes or no? A lot of no's. See, everybody always says, oh, you need a 2% raise per year. Well, unfortunately, we've been running much higher than 2% inflation, which means even if your boss gave you a 2% raise per year, keep in mind that he's not being as generous as you had thought. No raise, raise, whatever. Because inflation has been as high as 9% in the last 24 months. What are some expenses? That's where we're going to start today. This is a very generic start point. What are some expenses where your income goes to? I'm going to write these down. Phone. House. Food. Okay, now, what your goal should be to do right now is... In a flick of a finger, I need you to write down every single one of your expenses. Well, Patrick, that's kind of hard. I've got a lot of expenses. Well, that's the point of today's call is teaching you about this. See, I could say what's your expenses, but I guarantee you if I said now go to your credit card statement and scroll, you're going to find one subscription that you missed. True or true? How I many of you guys have a $7 subscription you forget to cancel and you can't remember your password? Or maybe I'm the only one. Shoot, I've got multiple Adobe accounts charging me and I can't figure out how to how to cancel it. Shout out to Jason for, for, for that one. See, all of us have all these expenses, but we don't know where all they're going. So if you have expenses that you're like, man, I don't know, I want you to write them all down. And if you can't, that's an issue. And that's what this message and topic number two is about. So think about those expenses. Now, to start, in order to budget, you must track your money. If you're not tracking your money, you can't budget. If you can't budget, you can fill in the rest. Now, before we begin, I want to talk about the ostrich effect. How many of you guys have heard of this? The ostrich effect, also known as the ostrich problem, is a cognitive bias that describes how people often avoid negative information, including feedback that could help them monitor their goal progress. Instead of dealing with the situation, we theoretically bury our heads in the sand like ostriches. This avoidance can often make things worse, incurring costs that we might not have had to pay if we faced things head on. I'm going to give you some examples. Number one, of course, is money. You simply don't look at all of your bills, all of your money, because you don't want to see it because you know what's there. Another one that's an example is people don't go to the doctor. They won't go to the dentist. They don't go to the eye doctor. They don't go to the you know, regular doctor because... They don't want to deal with things, so they think if I don't look at it, it'll make it better, even though technically it just makes it worse. If you've ever done that, this is what you've done. You've buried your head in the sand. And with our money, if we bury our heads in the sand, we're screwed. Now, here's a study that was done by Lexington Law. Only 33% of people look at their money every day. Now, I don't know if that percentage is going to hold true in this, but everybody type yes or no in the chat box. How many of you do that? A lot of yeses, a lot of noes. You see that, guys? So how do you expect to know where your money is going if you don't look at it every day? How do you know that nobody got a hold of your debit card or credit card if you don't look at it every day? If you aren't looking at your money, how do you know that you're on track for your goals? You don't. 
that's like starting a new diet plan in the gym, eating right, going to the gym and not getting on the scale once a week to see how you're doing. How do you know if what you're doing is working? So again, what you have to do is you have to backtrack your goal. Because now you're looking at the money. You can start to backtrack your goal. For example, what if you wanted to save $1,000 a month? How many of you guys would like to be able to save an additional $1,000 a month right now? The answer, by the way, should be everyone, including me. We all should want more. You have to do the math and determine where you can save your money and earn more money. Now, think about this. You guys know me. Usually my calls, it's all about earning, earning, earning. This is a weird call for me, isn't it? We'll talk about earning in a bit. I don't usually talk about saving because... I believe that income solves a lot more problems than saving. But when income can't catch up quick enough, there is a learning curve to making more money. We have to save. I'm going to give you something really quick, guys. Right now, credit card balances are at the highest level in history. On Cyber Monday... There was approximately $1 billion worth of items purchased with the buy now, pay later option. The highest in history. I bring this up, guys, because it's not just about your bank accounts. It's also about credit if you use it. Now, I'll share. I have a credit card. I saw someone say, that's why I don't have a credit card. The reason I have a credit card is very simple. If I get my debit card stolen and they swipe it, the money comes right out of my bank account. They can drain it. If my credit card gets stolen, it doesn't touch my bank account and I can then call the credit card company and there's a barrier. That's the reason. Now, is there perks? Sure. But it's a protection reason. That's all. But don't have a credit card if you're not able to pay it off every single month. You are paying one of the highest interest payments of any personal loan on a credit card. But again, you have to start to do the math and determine where your money is going and how to earn more. Yes or no in the chat, how many of you guys right now in your current job have the ability to earn more money today? Now, yeses could be you're in a sales position. You can earn more money. You just sell more shit. Pardon my French, but hopefully we're good with each other by this point. Number two, maybe you're not on a salary. You're on hourly and they allow you to work overtime. You can make more money. Yes. If you're on a salary and you don't have the opportunity to make more, then that's tough. Now, my challenge for you today is if you do not have the ability to make inherently more money with more effort, more time, more work, you need to figure out something to do that. I'm not saying quit your job. Because in society today, expenses are rising faster than earnings and we need to get ahead of our expenses. There's no way to do that without earning more money. For a lot of people, this is true. You don't have a spending problem. You have an income problem. Now, there are some people out there that do have a spending problem. I'm not saying you don't, but for a lot of people, you're bunked up with three roommates. You cook at home every night. You don't go out to eat. You drive a beater of a vehicle. You have the iPhone 4. Like, I know there's people out there and still struggling. You don't have a spending problem. You have an income problem. On the flip side, there's people that are making 150 grand a year that are in debt paycheck to paycheck because they travel every week. They go to Starbucks every day. They do this, they do that. You know the drill. You have to think, what pot am I in? Maybe you're neither. Where do I fit? Now, here's where things start to crank up. Get, get good. Every single day, I receive an update on my money. I'm encouraging you to do the same. 
This not only helps with budgeting, but it's also going to help with your net worth. Fun fact, I could pull out my phone right now and I could tell every, to the penny, everyone to the penny, what my net worth is right now. If you can't do that, how are you tracking your money? Well, Andrew, I'm glad you asked. Welcome to the masterclass. So I get daily updates for all my cash accounts. What does that mean? My bank accounts, my checking, my savings, every single to the penny. I know exactly how much is in it, including credit cards, by the way. I'll know exactly what my balance is on every credit card account. I get daily updates for my stocks. Are they up or are they down today? I get daily updates for my crypto. Lately, I've been smiling. I get updates on my credit cards. Like I mentioned, the balances, they fluctuate. I get updates on the value of my real estate, which is cool because you get to watch it fluctuate. The point is, I look at it, not my bank account. I go deeper than that. I look at every account, and I can see it every single day. Now, the first thing I have is a document that shows me money earned and money spent across all of my accounts. Here's an example of it. I pulled this for last month. Obviously, I'm blurring out personal information. It shows me here on the on this side. Let me draw and annotate. Uh, oops, oops, oops. You guys are getting ahead of it now. Oops. Let me annotate this. It shows me right there. Deposit. It shows me when I paid off a credit card. See Capital One? Paid off a credit card. It shows me when I withdrew some money from Chase. It shows another deposit. And by the way, look at Chase, Morgan Stanley. Those are two different banks. American Express, that's a different credit card. You see how I'm seeing everything? Chase, 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 Amex, Capital One, Amex. Morgan Stanley, direct deposit. Again, Chase, withdrawal. Look at this, dividend payment for one of my investments. Stock split. Cash transfer into my, one of my accounts. All of this is in one place. Now, I'm going to just ease some of your worries, first of all that I get this specifically from the bank that I use. On the flip side, the good news is if you, if you, I'll, I'll show you again, there's another slide about this, but if you go search right now, net worth tracker, heck, even Credit Karma just started one. You can get these things connected up to where you link all your bank accounts and all your credit cards so you can start to get these reports. So this is from the bank of Morgan Stanley, this example. Some of your banks are gonna have this some of your banks won't. If they do, use it. If they don't, go to Credit Karma, go to Rocket Money, go to wherever it is that you want to track it. The point is, guys, put a one in the chat. If this alone is enough value for today's call, where you're like, man, I need to see everything. You have to be able to see everything. Now, this is only spending. Okay. Okay. This is all just spending money in, money out, money in, money out, but it lets me see it, okay? The second thing I have, which is arguably more fun, is my daily net worth report. Now, what that means is it shows me how much my assets are valued at, at that moment. It tracks it every 15 minutes. Every account, here's an example of just different accounts. This is a six page document for just that day. I pulled this on the fourth, this week I pulled this. You see that? I have six pages just like this. It shows me every cash account, did it go up or down today? Every credit card, did it go up or down today? Every real estate holding, did it go up or down today? Every stock, did it go up or down today? Crypto, did it go up or down today? I'm only showing you one page, but I'm sure you can get the drift of every other page. It shows me did it go up or down today? Am I losing on that investment? Am I winning on that investment? The point is, lots of you have investments. Lots of you have stuff. You don't see it every day. 
how do we expect to have success in our financial lives if we're not tracking every element of our financial success? The point I'm trying to make is you won't hit your goals if you're not looking at your money. And no, I wasn't concerned about security considering it was the bank. If, I mean, if you have money in a bank, that's enough exposure, right? How many of you guys are looking at your goals slightly different now, thinking, man, I don't know where I'm at? That was all Morgan Stanley with my bank. Some of your banks are going to allow it. Some of you won't. If they don't, again, go to net worth trackers, start researching them, and you need to do it. There's so much. There's so much. Now, every single day with great detail, I'm looking at this. So I want you to go find a good net worth tracker today and start setting that up. Because this is where I rant for just a moment. I got to tell you, society is so twisted now because of social media, it's insane. There's guys out there that got you thinking they're the richest thing next to Bezos and they're dead broken and so much debt, it's insane. And then there's guys out there trying their damnedest to provide you the most value possible. And because they don't show you watches and cars and bullshit every single day, you don't follow them. Sorry. It's the reality of life. Oh, why did, why do all those guys do that? Why do they do that? That's how they gain their business. That's fine. I'm not knocking it. But what I want you to understand is some of you right now, I just put a reel out about it just like last week. Some of you right now are down on yourselves. You feel down. You feel like you're behind. Dude, I'm telling you right now, I know people personally that are driving cooler cars, living in better houses, eating better food, and they're hundreds of thousands of dollars, not in debt on their mortgage, in personal loans just to try to survive. I know people like that today. On the flip side, I know people right now with millions liquid sitting in cash and you wouldn't know it because they're in their 09 Lexus IS. The point is, I do not want you to get caught up in this comparison game that social media has ruined us with. I have tried to make it a point on my social media to never lead in marketing anytime with the items I have, even to the point of that reel we shot in the parking lot. Could have showed what car I was in, couldn't I? Didn't. Because that, if you're going to click on me, if you're going to come to this webinar, because I'm, I'll just speak to you guys blunt. If you're going to come to the webinar because I'm sitting in my Lambo, you don't deserve to sit in this webinar because now you just want what I have. You don't want the value that I have. Do you think I got that car because of what? The knowledge? Yes. So go and track yourself. And then the last thing, and then I'll move on. You're just in a comparison game with yourself. That's all. That's it. Who gives a shit what Tyler's doing? I don't care what Sloppy's doing. I don't care what Amy's doing. Not out of a bad way. I don't care. Last year, I made an arbitrary number, whatever, $274,000, let's say. Let's say that's what I made last year. Then this year, my goal should be to make more than that. 374, 474, 574. That is it. I'm not comparing to the ding dong here and that guy there. Can I get an amen? How many of you guys right now are getting value out of this from a free master class? By the way, the stuff that I paid $25,000 for from my attorneys and all that stuff, we haven't even gotten there yet. This is just the, this is the appetizer 
to the meal. Are we doing all right? It's 1049. We've been at this a while. We got more to go. You guys going to stick with me? Okay. We're going to take one more three-minute break, and then we're going to go through it. Okay. Go on your IG right now. Tag some of your notes. Tag the screen. Tag some friends. Tag myself. Spend some time doing that really quick. And we'll be back here in three minutes. Who in here loves this title as much as me? I'm going to turn my webcam off. Who in here loves this title as much as yours truly? I love investing. And, and this next segment is where I prove to you that you can make money 98% of the time, not clickbait, no BS, truly. But in this next segment, I want to shape your mind a little bit. And I'm going to share with you guys everything from mindset to books that I've read. Olivia, shout out to you for that. You'll see why in a little bit. And um, what I can tell you before I start here, guys, is investing is without a doubt, to me, the most fun thing. It's like adult video games. I love it. And um, if this topic of conversation is new to you or challenging, maybe it's scary. I hopefully by the end of this segment have eased your mind a little bit. I don't know why, but early on, I've always had, a, I would say a, a decent risk, uh, risk tolerance. Not that I like to just throw money. I don't like losing, but I've always just basically said to myself, I can make money whenever I want. I believe in the statement that if you provide enough value to any marketplace, to people, to something, you can make as much money as you want. I know for a fact that I can make as much money as I want in any time. And that's why I'm always able to be aggressive with my investing endeavors because I know that more money will come in. But that in itself is like a little leap of faith there because some of you might feel shaky about your ability to make more money outside of your job. And that's where really a inside look into how the wealthy are think. They think they don't think about investing as this massive risk. They think, let's go get some more money and put it to work. So before we start, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, if you are sitting on cash right now, your money is dead. Now, before I begin, as a disclaimer, the only time you should be sitting on cash and saving cash is for what? For an upcoming investment. So you got to save to make an investment, but you never want to be saving for a, God, they ingrained it in our head so bad, my parents' generation, man. They screwed us in the respectful way. Save for a rainy day. Oh, yeah, well, it's always raining in this economy. I have this question for you. Do you win in Monopoly by passing go every time, not doing anything? Or by investing in houses and hotels? You win by investing. But let me ask you another question. Think about this for a minute. Who is winning early on? Who's winning at the beginning when they're not investing? The person passing go. They have more money at the beginning because the other people are putting their money to work. You have to think about life almost as a monopoly board. We have to be able to invest in these pieces that appreciate in value and gain us income long-term. Remember when I said your money is dead? This is a graph of the buying power of $1 from 1900 worth a dollar to less than 10 cents, actually less than 5 cents today. Save for a rainy day. Yeah, every day you save it for a rainy day, it diminishes in value.
Scary, isn't it? Bring some context. Some of you guys are born in 1940. Some of you are born in the 60s. Some of you are born in the 80s. Some of you the 90s. Some of you the 2000s. Did you know that unless you were born in the 20s, which I don't think there's a 100-year-old on this call, Unless you were born in the 20s, there was no other time in history where the value of your money appreciated. The point is, every single person on this call has never lived in a society where your, your money has gone up in value in terms of buying power at any point in time. Isn't that scary? Why? Well, we just saw it in COVID. They print it. That's why. And when they print, what happens to the supply? It increases. And when there's more of it, people can spend it. Now what happens? Everybody wants to spend it on that car. And funny enough, those cars went up in value. Because people have more of it and you continue to print and print and print. It's one of the interesting things about supply and demand. We can print more money. We can't print more land in downtown Scottsdale or in Bozeman, Montana or in Los Angeles or Miami or wherever you live. You can't print more land. You can't print more gold. But you can print when times get tough, the printing machine turns on and you get a stimulus check and you get a stimulus check and then we wonder why our buying power continues to diminish. That's just one example that's more recent in your memory. So our buying power dissolves over time. Yet in general, over time, what has the market done? The S&P 500 has done what? Has it gone up or down? So wait a minute, there's a vehicle that has consistently gone up over the last 100 years. And then there's another vehicle that has gone nothing but go down in the last 100 years, yet most people have the wrong information and they have most more of this than they do anything else. Something sounds wrong with that. And the trouble is most people will never stay invested. Society, society excuse me, is messed up for this. In the 1950s and 60s, the average hold time for a stock on the New York Stock Exchange was seven years. People were able to buy a stock, hold it, and then get out. Now it's less than a year. Because we live in a microwave society, what does that mean? I use this metaphor all the time. If I go in the freezer today, and I grab that box of chicken out, and it says on the back, it's got the the oven instructions or the microwave instructions. Society today with their money will put their money in the microwave even though it tastes better in the oven and we all know it. It's also playing on what I mentioned a little bit ago. It's the get rich quick society. Listen, I don't want to get rich quick. I want to get rich for sure. And so what happens is, is our attention spans are lowering because of our TikToks and our reels. And we're seeing all these people in this market and that market. They're getting rich off the Goku coin or whatever the hell they're doing over there in the weird crypto land. And guess what? Our attention spans to our money is going smaller and smaller and smaller. And if we put our money in a market and we don't have results right away, we get out. Yet if you stayed invested, if you kept your money in the markets, if you invested money that you could afford to lose, the odds of you making money would skyrocket. Put a, put a one in the chat if you don't believe me when I say I can show you a 98% chance of making money. If you don't believe me, you call my bluff. That's clickbait, Patrick. All right, that'll be the last time you call my bluff. Here is the probability of having a return for time spent in the market. Let's start to look at this really quick. I need to annotate this. Look at this, guys. Okay, check this out. So cool. Here's one year in the market. At one year in the market, you're right here. 
What is that? A 70% chance of making money. Go over here. At four years in the market, you're right here. About a 88% chance of making money. At nine years in the market, you're right here. You have a 95, it's still clickbait, 95% chance of making money if you hold for nine years. At 12 years, look at that. 98% chance of making money. If you had simply held for the golden 12 years. The point I'm trying to make is, guys, you cannot think about wealth creation, investing. I don't care if it's in crypto, commodities, real estate, stocks. I'm going to just cut it to you straight. The average human being cannot beat Wall Street. The average human being cannot time the market. You understand the people that can time the market are anomalies. It's hard. Guys, I've been trading the markets for 10 years. It's still so freaking hard. I had a really good play that I just got out of yesterday on Royal Caribbean. I've been in it for three years. I was able to time the bottom and I just got out. And it was a 250 something percent return in those three years. But do you understand the amount of effort and time I've had to put into my craft to understand that market? I'm going to be straight with you. Most of you will never put in the amount of effort that I've put in my craft over the last 10 years. And that's okay because you don't want to become a full-time trader. Am I right? But what I'm showing you here is if you had put your money in the market, the S&P 500, and just click one button and don't do anything else. These are your probabilities of making money over a specific period of time. When you see this, and I put this into context, does this not make the money game look a little bit easier? The reason you're not doing it is because you feel that, you know, $100 or whatever it is, is not the big enough amount. It doesn't, I don't know if Patrick's still on here. He's going to laugh if he is. There's another Patrick, one of my buddies. I don't know if he's still on here, but it doesn't move the needle. It's his favorite term. It doesn't move the needle. There he is. A lot of people think I'm not going to invest in the money the long term because it doesn't move the needle. Yet I can tell you my first investment was $300 and that $300 turns into the next and then the next and then the next and then the next. And suddenly the non-moving needle actually starts to move over time. But so many people avoid doing it because they think it's too hard debunked. Was that clickbait or no? And number two, they think, oh, it's not, it's not worth it for me. It's worth it because for every hundred dollars you got in the bank account, and I'll psychologically, I'll trick you in a minute and show you how to do this. For every hundred dollars you got in the bank account, it's dying and you put it over here. Finally, 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 it's actually growing. Let's go to the next slide. First of all, how many of you guys would attend another masterclass if I hosted one? Put a one in the chat. Now that you kind of get the vibe of these. I'm going to be hosting all year long masterclasses just like this. Listen, last year I made a goal and I don't think I did the best. And I said, I want to impact more people specifically in the ages of 18 to 30 than ever before. Because it's a lost generation. It's a lost cause. I got to be honest. And I'm seen as weird and most things with people from close to me that knew me growing up. But for the rest of you, you want to learn how to do this stuff. So we're going to do an entire masterclass where I spend hours just on investing. Now, to start, yeah, we're just starting on the investing talk. Investing should be in your budget plans. What do I mean by that? Part of your budget literally needs to be pulling out for investments. So you need to say, when I make X, I'm going to put a percentage 
plan to put put a specific percentage of whatever you make each month into the market. Every year for my long-term account, I put money, typically it's March. Not that there's any data to back, uh, it doesn't matter. The point I'm trying to make is. But every year, once a year for my long-term account, I put the same amount of money in or percentage of money in, excuse me. And I put it in and then I put it in. And the next year, and I don't care if the market's at an all-time low, all-time high, it doesn't matter. I put it in the markets. I'm getting rid of the cash because cash is trash. How do they consider? I'm challenging you for a minute. You guys have all been in school. How many of you guys have been in school and you were taught what cash was? Is cash an asset or a liability? An asset. They teach you it's an asset. It shows up as an asset on your balance sheet. Name one other investment vehicle that consistently has depreciated in value over 100 years that they consider an asset. They don't. You guys, money is a liability in my eyes. I know that's a switch from what you've seen. Money is a liability in my eyes. That's an opinion. That's not whatever. But I don't say cash is king. I say cash is trash. Now, here's where society today, especially people in their 20s and 30s, get it wrong. They say, oh, cash is trash. And then they go and buy BS that doesn't go up in value. That's not what that meant. That meant to take the money that you have in cash and put it in things that are consistently appreciating over the long term where you can actually see a track record for it. See, the key here is to get invested. But then the challenge, we can all get invested. It's to stay invested. Does everybody know why? Because I just showed you why. The longer you stay, the better your odds. You have to stay invested. Time spent in the market, I've seen many of you typing this just a minute ago, beats timing the market. What does that mean? 95% of you are not going to be able to outperform the market. You're just not. You think you are and you think it's easy. You're not. So what this means is time spent in the market, putting capital into the market and letting it ride, not touching it. 95% of the time, you're going to beat the people that are trying to go in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. You want to know why? Here's why. These are people that invested in the S&P 500, 1990 to 2019. Those people, and by the way, the average annual return of the S&P is higher than this now. But those people that did that, fully invested, made 7.7% .7 a year. What this means is they don't do anything. They put their money in the market. They don't touch it, period. Never pull it out, never do anything. The only thing they do is add more cash into their account. If they miss just one day of the year that happened to be the best day of the year, just one day, they went from 7.7 .7 to 3.9% gain. How about that? Half. If they tried to miss, or if they tried to time the market and they thought they could kid it and they missed the best day of each year. If they miss two of the best days each year, they basically broke even. Congratulations, you didn't make money. If they miss three of the best days of the year, they start losing money. If they missed five of the best days of the year, they lost 6.3%. They might as well have not invested. And if they missed 20, forget about it. They lost a quarter of their money. Yet so much of society is doing this. Why? Because they're in the market. And then they're like, man, I think it's going to do this. And they let their ego get in the way. They pull out. Then the market skyrockets and they miss. It's time to switch your thinking. What I mean by that, it's time to think about this as a long-term thing. You just add to it. And what is this doing, generally speaking, over time? What is it increasing? You put $1,000 in, now it's worth $1,200. What has it just done to you? It's increased your net worth. 
And one of my biggest things to think about today, if you haven't picked up on it, is you try to do things that impact your net worth. Whereas society is trying to do things that will impact their bank account. There's a difference. How many of you guys need a second to pull the jaw off the floor a little bit? When I first saw this, I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. And realized then that I got to be in the market for the long term. So here's a mindset shift for you. Big time. At the moment that you invest in a stock, I'll say Apple. Let's say Apple's $100 a share and you have $100 to invest. At the moment that you invest in a stock, does your net worth go down? Yes or no? You take $100 cash and you put it into a stock. So now you have $100 in stock, no longer $100 in cash. Let's not worry about fees. Let's not worry about any of that. Yes or no? No. Now, next question. If you go into Gucci, some of you will, some of you won't, you buy a belt, does your net worth go down? Yes or no? You're all saying yes. How about this one? What about a Ford truck aside from COVID years? Will your net worth go down? They always say the moment you leave the lot, what happens? Car goes down like whatever they say, 10%, 20%, I don't know, 20%. Yeah, it impacts. You lose value. How about some Lululemon shorts for just a random item? Yeah. And by the way, I don't know if you guys have Lululemon. Jesus, I wish I owned Lululemon. They're charging men and women around the world for this thin material, like 150 bucks for these yoga pants that these girls wear. Wild. The point I'm trying to make today is you guys just said it went down when I bought a Ford. It went down when I bought Gucci. It went down when I bought Lulu. But it didn't go down. When? When I bought a stock. Yet in all of the scenarios, what happened to your bank account? Did it increase or decrease? Yeah, our cash decreased. I spent $100 on a stock. The cash account decreases. I spent $400 on a, on a Gucci belt. It decreased. I spent $30,000 on a truck. It decreased. I spent $100 on Lulu. It decreased. Here's why society doesn't invest. What did they just do? They looked at their bank account and it did what? When they invested in the stock, it decreased. And they associate their bank account decreasing with spending. When all it did was go from one account to another. You have to start looking at these investments as I've got account A, which is cash, and account B, which is my stock account. And all I did was transfer it. And all that happened is my cash account went down, my investment account went up. But because I have not been trained mentally, I look at my cash account and I think that I'm more broke than I was, yet my net worth now, because Apple appreciated 10% in the last three months, is actually higher. Any breakthroughs happening yet on this call today? Put a one in the chat. Anything that clicked, that was meant to be one of the biggest hits of the call from a mental standpoint, intentionally. Great. Your mind may currently be associating investing cash as spending it. They're not the same thing. At all. Listen, you're not poor, you're cash poor. Because you just invested in the stock market. You just invested in real estate. You just invested in commodities. Yet people associate being broke or poor with their bank account. Listen, your bank account is nothing. Yes, cash is a position in a portfolio. You look at a portfolio, your cash account is a position. But it's only sitting there for one reason to get ready to invest in the next run. Your money's gone nowhere, guys. It's just in a different account. 
Buying things that have a history and appreciating and value, simply put, is your only goal here, folks. That's life. We now know that over history, the worst asset of all time is the United States dollar. It's terrible. One dollar is now worth less than five cents. We learned that on today's call. We now know we need to get rid of those things. Now, of course, they're not going to teach you this in school very much. Of course not. Why would they? They want you to be a good, obedient employee. But you need, <laughs> you need to look at things that have a history of appreciating and value. Can anybody name some things that they know has a history of appreciating and value when done right? Stocks. Commodities. I saw a lot of gold being mentioned. Real estate. Treasuries. A little more timing with that one than any of them. Now, I share this with you because I, I can only teach you so much. This book changed the way I thought. This book. I'm not a reader. I am not a reader. But I, I'll tell you a story. I was flying home around this time, actually, a few years ago to Butte, Montana. And as I sit down on the plane, the guy next to me happens to be a really successful guy from Butte that I've known for a long time. His kids went to school uh, with me. We sat down and we started talking about the markets. And I was just talking like I'm talking to you guys. And he said, you know, have you read Tony Robbins' book, Unshakable? And I said, I hadn't. He's like, the way you talk, you sound just like you're literally a spitting image of this book. And I said, that's interesting. I went and read this book and it got even sharper for me to realize that none of this bullshit matters. You get the money in the market into things that are low cost, that have a great chance and a his historical yield average, and you let it run. So if you have not read this book, I get nothing. I, I told you guys I'm not selling anything. You don't have to go buy it. But if you have a couple bucks to buy the online version or, or, or 20 bucks to buy the normal version, I think it's money well spent or a library, whatever it is. I really do. And I don't agree with everything Tony Robbins does. You probably don't agree with everything I even say. But this book, I can tell you, was uh, one of two books that changed the way I thought about investing. The other one, which is more about risk, is called Trading. I don't have it up here, by the way, so you have to write it down. Trading in the Zone by Mark Douglas. Trading in the Zone by Mark Douglas. That book was, was phenomenal for the way that I thought about my risk. All right, guys. I'm doing good. If you're doing good, I don't really want to take another break because I want to get you guys in and out of here. How are we doing? Now we're going to change gears to stability. I'm going to really step on some toes for the next 25 minutes. And then the last one organization is the one that uh, a lot of the higher level guys are looking forward to LLCs, bank structures, lots of stuff there. Stability is where I am going to step on your guys's toes. Some of you, not at all others, a lot. But this is going to be a really important section. We'll take a break from four to five. It'll be our, our last break. And then we'll do organization, topic five, and Q&A. We will also uh, draw more winners then as well of uh, Amazon gift cards. So now we're going to talk about stability. So now I want you to think about the evolution of today. Okay, here's the evolution. You now have topics about your goals. You understand your goals. You're laser focused on your goals. And by the way, don't forget, we're starting tomorrow, right? 21 days to form that habit. Then we now know to hit our financial goals, we need to start being laser focused in on our money and we need to get budget reports made. However, you're going to do that. You need to start looking at that money. For some, it's going to be very easy. You got one bank account, one credit card, golden, no investments. For others, you got 15 bank accounts, 32 credit cards, 50 investment accounts. It's going to take some time. 
it is time well spent. Then number three, we just talked about now that we know our money's going and we've got some money in our budget to invest, what did I just prove to you? The market is a great vehicle for long-term success and cash is trash. But now we're on topic four, which is stability. It's the reality right now. I made a post yesterday. I don't know how many of you guys follow me on Instagram. There's another bajillion. Um, thank you guys for sharing it on your story, by the way. But I made a post yesterday. Let me see if it's still up. Yes, it is. 23 hours ago. You guys can go. Actually, if you go to my story right now, go to Instagram, go to my story, read it with me. P. Kenny FX. So you can see the image. I said, the economy is really starting to expose those that didn't play it right in the last three years. Warm up for the next three. That's what we're talking about now. The amount of people that I know right now that are starting to struggle financially because they lived beyond their means for the last three years in the, in the golden era of COVID where they were printing more money than they knew what to do with and everybody was making money. You could do anything and make money. You could buy any stock and make money. Buy any crypto, make money. Buy any real estate, make money. Everybody was a financial genius. And now guess what's happening? It's exposing the shit out of a lot of these people. The people that did investments right and then what I'm about to talk about right are the people that are currently winning. How many of you guys are currently 1099 contractors, real estate agents, loan officers, insurance brokers, solar agents, network marketers? Put a one in the chat box if you're any of these. Or frankly, you get a 1099. Doesn't have to be just these. I am talking to you for the next 25 minutes. And if you have guys on a sales team and you are, are not seeing their name pop up in the chat, make sure they're on this call. That is you. Here we go. As a 1099, don't think into this too much. Is your income predictable? It's not a U.S. thing either. There might be a different form outside of the U.S., but if you sell real estate or in any sales position or own a business, you are this person. Is your income predictable? Now, I know you could read between the lines and say, well, yes, Patrick, it's predictable by my work effort. But no, it's not predictable. You don't get five grand a month, do you? You get whatever value you provide, whatever sale you make. You're only as good as your next one. And so if your income isn't predictable, you need your spending to be predictable. Lifestyle inflation is what is currently killing you potentially, and your sales team's progress in life. I see it happen time and time again. And I want to draw lifestyle inflation. First of all, as a disclaimer, I want to share with you guys that I am only sharing this because I made this mistake. Listen, when I was 18 in college, my first year, I made approximately $80,000. That was my first year. Starting to learn business, starting to learn trading, starting to learn investing. Guys, I was flipping shoes. Made 80 grand. And, and pretty much at the end of the year, there was nothing to show for it. You know how hard that is when you live in your parents and you're in college? And Stana, I think I saw you on here. You live in Butte, Montana. Let's face it, it's not that expensive. It wasn't investing, it was spending. The reason I bring this up, guys, is they always say the greatest lessons are learned through experience. And I'll tell you what, your boy experienced it. And if I could stop even one person today from making the same mistake I'm about to share, then, uh, man, it's going to be good. That means my, my, my work here was done and it was done for the right reasons. So let's draw out lifestyle inflation. First, we're going to talk about a 1099 contractor. Give me a minute to figure out how to do the colors. So your income is in green. Now, here's your income. You guys get it, right? As a 1099 contractor, as a real estate agent, do you have ebbs and flows in your business? Yes or no? But generally, you hope that your business is doing what in terms of your income, going up or down? In a macro trend, longer term trend, going up. And so let's say that this is 5,000 a month. This is 10,000 a month. This is 20,000 a month. 
I know these numbers might seem big. Remember that attainable thing at the beginning of the call. 20,000 a month to some of you in here is a bad month. To others, you can't even fathom making that much money. Keep that in mind. It's all a mindset thing. 30,000, 50,000, you guys get the drift? That's the amount of money that you're making. Here's what lifestyle inflation is about. Lifestyle inflation in red is your expenses. It's constantly chasing, oh shit, chasing, oh shit, and chasing the money that you're making to inflate your lifestyle, to improve your quote unquote living standards, to impress people that never think about you at night when they lay their head on the pillow. That's lifestyle inflation. What that means in layman's terms is you start making five grand a month, you're spending 4,500. Then when you start making 20 grand a month, now you're spending 20. And you get to these points where you're at a deficit. We're actually spending more than you're making and you're trying to get rid of stuff. We all agreed a minute ago that our income as a 1099 is not predictable. And for anybody that's not in the United States and you're like, Patrick, I don't know what a 1099 is. Think anything sales. So if you're from anywhere else in the US and you're in a sales-based position, not in the US, excuse me, is your income predictable? No. Some months are better than others. What part of this equation, what line, red or, uh, red or green, can you control with predictability? You're red. Here's the magic of what I figured out, and I'm sharing with you my experience. I was that guy. What you just saw, that's me. I used to be that guy. It's, it's almost comical at this point. You live and you learn, whatever. But let me show you the next guy. Same income. Trajectory. But here's what this guy does. And by the way, I'm trying to draw a straight line. Bear with me. <laughs> look what happened. In fact, I'm trying to make it look like it's in a slight uptrend. Because as you do better, you should be able to treat yourself. Everybody agree? You should be able to go out to eat once in a while. You should be able to maybe buy that pair of shoes you've always wanted. Like, I, I agree with that. If, if you can't do that, then uh, yeah, you might as well not. Like, you might as well just not. But what's going on here? As time went on, look what happened. We've got surpluses. See, Here's the trouble with social media and society. Who looks back? I showed you chart A, which is the first chart, and here's chart B. To society, most likely, who looks like they're doing better? A or B? A, because they're spending more money. Who's actually doing better financially? B. So let me ask you a really hard-hitting question. I might step on your toe. Do you care more about your own well-being or what other people care about you, think about you. For some of you, that's a tough question because you're like, man, I just had a, I just had a chat with an extremely sex, uh, sorry, whoops, successful solar rep last week. I mean, this kid is in his twenties and he can pull in 500 grand to a million a year in commissions, that type of kid. And we were having a conversation over the phone. And guess what he told me? He's like, bro, I got to send you a picture of this. It was like a Versace shirt and then this diamond uh, like, like bracelet. I was like, okay, cool. So he sends me and I'm on the phone. This is no joke. And I go, did you know that's like literally not cool? Like, do you know how broke you look if you wear a Versace shirt? Louis Vuitton, Gucci, like an emblem on your shirt. 
He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, go find me one actually successful person that isn't wearing probably like a black t-shirt or something or a polo. I said, is your goal to be rich or look rich? Because I can help you either way. I've done both. Now, again, I can't blame him because I just shared with you guys that is the same thing. Now, Butte, Montana, I didn't have the luxury of uh, of Louis Vuitton. Didn't exist in Butte, Montana. Other stuff did, though. Four-wheelers did. Side-by-sides did. Travels did. Lydia's every three nights did. If you know, you know. So what I'm trying to say, guys, is this is the start. Now, the next part of this is where it's about to get good. And I'm about to share a personal item with you 2024 will be my first year where without working one minute my money will make me a little over one hundred thousand dollars how cool is that my investments will yield me a six-figure income in 2024 that'll be the first year it's ever been like that now why i mention that to you guys is that is because of the next thing that I'm about to show you. What do we have here? We have a surplus. Okay? This is surplus. All of this green is surplus. Now, when you have surplus, what can you do with your money? You can invest it. And so then you you reinvest into crypto. By the way, anybody on my YouTube channel, did you guys watch me put out that video last November when I decided to buy crypto at 16000 publicly, shared the account? And then here we are a year later, and you guys already know what my account looks like. I don't even have to show it to you. And by the way, I only put stuff like the real estate flip, crypto. I put it all on YouTube intentionally because I'm showing you as I'm doing it. So check this out. All the surplus, guess what happens? It comes back here to my income and my income line changes from light green, which is like baby green, like baby money to the dark green. You know why? Look at that. Now my investments on top of my income is making me even more. Holy shit. Is are anybody catching this? And now you can say, Patrick, I want to live a little. Okay, go live. Go live a little. And look at that surplus still. Now you can look wealthy and you're wealthy. Oh my gosh, imagine that. But guess what it takes? Delayed gratification. It takes time. I'm sharing with you because some of you guys here are young and nobody can tell you lick. My parents couldn't either at the time. Somebody in here right now, you got too big of an ego. And there's only two reasons people fail in life. It's either ignorance or arrogance or a combination of both. You're either ignorant to what you don't know or you're too arrogant to sit down and learn it. There's plenty of people that are barely making any money that knew about this webinar and they thought, no, no way. Can't get on that. Because they made, what, 80 grand this year, 150 grand this year, and they think they're hot shit. Every single year I get in these conversations with different people around me and I'm like, man, I'm broke. That's how I feel. Your network should start to push you in that way. Like, God, I used to think 400 was it was a good year. You know, you start to think different. You used to think 80 was a good year. And the truth is it is. You always want to be gracious with yourself. So I tell people closest to me, look, you made 120 this year. Be proud of yourself. But this is a little bit of a different conversation. So when we start to do this and start to make our money, if we do this right, this is the trajectory. Now, I know this is slightly more mindset section here, and I told you I'd step on some toes. But I would advise that if you have kids or grandkids, You share this segment with them or the recording, whatever you got to do, because maybe a 27-year-old that can relate to them on TikTok can get through to them more than you can. That they will not learn this in high school. They will not learn this in college. 
Nobody's going to tell them that. And right now, of course, they're going to tell you you don't know anything. But I promise by the time they're 25, 26, 27, they're going to be calling you saying, I don't know anything. Can you help me? But the second part of this, and then I'll move on. I don't care if you're 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Do you think it's too late? No. It's not too late. It's never too late to start a new you. It's never too late to attack those goals. So let me erase this. I hope that this brought you, I know this is very basic stuff, maybe for some, but I really want you to bring to, to gain value from this because maybe I just checked someone that was thinking about that stupid bracelet. The last thing I'll share with you is if you do purchase items, big time items, make sure it has some sort of tax implication. We'll talk about some stuff like that in another masterclass, meaning a write-off. Or I don't, I'm, I don't have it on right now. For instance, some of you know that I like to buy something specific. It's a material item that you wear. Does anybody know what, what it is? I know some of you know. Watches. Shout out to Max and Patrick. Got me on an addiction. The reason that I love buying watches is because it's one of the only items that I've ever found that I can spend the money, yet its stored value is in there. You know, I bought a GMT2. It's a root beer. It's like a $15,000 retail watch. I've had it for two years. And today, the, the Rolex market got destroyed, by the way, like massive crash. I could sell it for 17, 18,000. I'm being conservative, maybe more if I'm on the right side. The point is my money is not gone, poof, like it would be with a Gucci shirt or diamond bracelet or Louis Vuitton pants or shoes. It's stored in something. So if I need that capital back for something better or an emergency, I can so how I look at spending, guys, aside from my necessities, and of course, you have to enjoy life a little bit. This summer, I spent 985,000 credit card points, almost a million credit card points on travel this summer at amazing spots. So I didn't spend a dime, yet I would spend, like July 4th, I went to Sedona, $6,000 weekend, all credit card points. So if I spend, I try to spend with incentives like credit card points, number two, tax write-offs, or number three, something that will impact my net worth in at minimum a break-even way, meaning I won't lose value. So then you just basically start to ask yourself, well, if I'm going to buy this material item, ladies, am I going to buy the Louis Vuitton bag or am I going to save till I can get the Birkin? Because the Birkin is going to hold Louis Vuitton bags immediately down. Gentlemen, am I going to go into, oh God, you guys know me and Hublot. Am I going to go into Hublot? Hublot brand, brand hates me. Am I going to go into Hublot and lose 50% of my value the moment I buy that watch? Don't ever buy one. Shout out Hublot. Never buy one. Spend 10 grand and it's worth five the moment you leave the door. Or am I going to get on a waiting list and wait two years and finally get that Rolex that's 11 grand? Now it's worth 13 when I leave the door. You see the difference? So I'm never saying in this, you can't spend money. I'm saying try to be cognizant of what items you're buying that are big. I'm not talking about the $20 item that you want. I'm talking about the big purchases. And if you want to travel, do it, as I just mentioned. You always have to treat yourself. It's not this message. It's be cognitive of what you're spending your money on. In 2024, I believe the markets are interesting. The economy is interesting. The Fed right now, I watched the Fed Funds Futures. Newsflash, looks like March of 2024 is their first reduction. It's going to be an interesting year. And what you should desire right now is stability in your finances. Because I can tell you something, peace of mind, man. The fact that next year I'll make what I'll make and I know I'll be good. How many of you guys would pay money? to have that peace of mind. Of course you would. When you have peace of mind, you perform better. You're a better spouse. You're a better son. You're a better brother. You're a better sister, better business partner. 
you're a better you when you have peace of mind. There's not a dollar you can put on peace of mind. The markets are shaky. And as you guys know, now that you know, cash is trash. But while you're saving it, depending on what happens in the next few years, those with cash will win. Now, what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to wait for about three minutes and then we're going to start. This is the last segment for my advanced entrepreneurs where I'm going to share some bank account tips and tricks as well as organizational structures from a legal standpoint. This is big. This is information that I've spent tens of thousands of dollars to accumulate over the years in attorney fees, accounting fees, you name it. We're going to share it next on the call, guys. Put some ones in the chat if so far the money that you have spent, which is your time today, has been worth it. I appreciate your guys' support. We are getting started here in just a few minutes. All right. Are we back, ladies and gentlemen? Put some ones in the chat. We're two hours 20 in. It's lunchtime around here. I got to push through this. I'm starving. We have another little bit to go. This last section, I got to tell you, there is no mindset here. This is just simply to try to help you guys understand moving around money when you make money, specifically 1099. Now, I'm speaking from context of the U.S. Unfortunately, those of you guys um, internationally, it doesn't mean you can't gain value from this. It means you're going to have to take this information and go research like the equivalent of what I'm talking about. Does that make sense? Because it's going to be a little bit more difficult. But how many of you guys, this is the target market today. If you are 1099 from the US, put a one in the chat. 1099 from the US. I got to tell you, those of you that are putting a one in the chat, 1099, you're real estate, you're doing sales, you're doing insurance, you're doing solar, you're doing network marketing, whatever it is. The next 25 minutes in a crucial way could be the most impactful 25 minutes of this call. And so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about getting organized. Do any of you guys feel like LLCs and bank accounts and all this stuff is like a third world language? And you're like, what the heck is going on? And, and how do I, how do I kind of manage this? I have to say that I spent the last 10 years learning myself and I'm about to share with you what not to do, which is stuff that I used to do and some ideas of what to do. But I go back to my disclaimer. This is all me telling you a story and just an opinion, I would highly suggest if this stuff resonates with you, talk to accountants, talk to lawyers, attorneys, different things about what's best for you. This, this stuff may not be the best for you, but I'm going to be sharing some really expensive information over the next 25 minutes. So first of all, I want you to understand that organization in your businesses from a money standpoint and a legal shield, LLC, legal liability standpoint, is preparation. A lack of preparation is not a good thing. They always say, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. You ever heard that term? Well, in business, a plan is not just a business plan. A plan is also organization. And so today I'm going to talk about how I do this. And hopefully by the end of this, you have clarity in what to do, or maybe I've made it more simple for you and what not to do. I'm going to be speaking to some of you, by the way. Okay. You're going to be listening to this and going, uh-oh, that's me. That's fine. I did it too. I'm trying to incentivize you to maybe change your ways. So let's start by organizing any legal entity that we have. LLC specifically. Put a one in the chat if you've got an LLC. You've got at least one LLC that you own. Okay. And if you're in a different country... Maybe you own a legal entity, maybe you don't, but still take notes. So if you own an LLC, I want to start by talking about my binders. Now, I've posted this part on social, but I'm going to get into more detail today. Now, first of all, I want to give you a disclaimer because the most asked question is saying is that could be said from here is, Patrick, couldn't you just use a computer? And for whatever reason, I don't know about you guys, I love paper. 
I'd rather be, I would rather wait a week to be paid in a physical check than direct deposit. I love to feel it. And in this case, organization, I love binders for organization. I love the physical stuff. I lose stuff on the computer all the time. I don't know what folder it went to. I don't know how to find it. I want it in my hand. Now, the last thing I'll say, because I don't want to forget to say it. If I do forget, I don't want to forget. So make sure this information is going in a safe spot. A safe, maybe. Okay. So I use binders. Quite literally, these are some of my binders. I literally get a black binder that's the small binder. And then I print out a piece of paper and I literally type the name of the LLC on that piece of paper so that I know that that binder is everything for that LLC that's important. Now, that's what that looks like. I could stop there, but put a one in the chat if you get some value out of what's in the binder, of knowing what's in the binder. So inside of each binder, write this down. There's, there's a key component here. Inside of each binder is the articles of organization, which is quite literally showing that you exist as an entity. It's the name of your entity. It'll have your address on it. That's page number one. So you open the binder and on page number one is articles of organization. Actually, stand by. And just for sake of example, if you guys look at my webcam really quick, you see me now, here's the binder. I had the picture, but when you open it up, here's the pages. I just want to prove to you guys, this is all the stuff that I like to do to be more organized. So in the binder, that first page you just saw is articles of organization. Page number two is my EIN number. Now, if you don't know what an EIN number is, Think about this as the social security number for your business. That's it. So you have the articles, you have your EIN number. Number three, engagement letter with the attorney. I prefer using an attorney versus legal Zoom. And there's plenty of attorneys you can find. You can, I mean, Upwork is an example of trademark attorneys I've even used. But in this engagement letter, it's not only saying what the attorney is going to do for you, which is going to be create an LLC, but it also has instructions. So here's why that's important. I own multiple LLCs. You're going to find that. Well, technically I don't. I guess that's a snippet of in a little bit, but I have, I should say, multiple LLCs. And every LLC I have to sign slightly different. And so when I sign on a contract, if I don't sign the way that the LLC was structured, technically that contract could be voided if you got in a, a lawsuit or something. And so every single LLC I have to sign slightly different. Like sometimes I have to sign just Patrick Kenny. Sometimes I have to sign Patrick Kenny, comma, its member. Sometimes I have to sign Patrick Kenny, comma, its manager. There's different things that I must do. And your attorney's going to know what to do in that regard. But that's number three is the engagement letter. Number four is the operating agreement. Now, this is important to have, especially if you have business partners, but not exclusively. If you're alone and you own your own LLC, you've got no partners, you still need an operating agreement technically to have a legal business. And these can be boiler. If it's just you, it could be the most boilerplate operating agreement possible. But something that you need to think about is if this business you plan to own long-term, you got to think about what if you die? I, that's crazy, I know. But when I create operating agreements, what it's saying is, if I were to pass, God forbid, knock on wood, prematurely, where does this business go? Mom and dad. Now, I know that this is deep stuff for a minute, but some of you own a business right now and you're like, oh shit. It's like your will for the business. Now, it might be in your will already, but double it. Have it in your operating agreement as well. Now, the second part is if you have a partner. I want you to think about the operating agreement as the prenup in your marriage. Everybody know what a prenup is? Maybe you don't. But the operating agreement is saying, what if shit hits the fan? Or what if they pass, meaning die? Or what if, you know, ding, 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 ding. These different scenarios happen. 
If you do not have an operating agreement that has addressed every scenario possible, and you need to spend some money on this, guys. Spend some time on it too, especially if you have partners. If you don't have a partner, you can get this done quick and easy. But if you have business partners, take it from me. And this could be an awkward thing to hear right now because there might be people that are business partners on this call. I know that you're bros and you're great partners. And no matter what, let me tell you, in business, things can happen. And if you do not have a phenomenal operating agreement and something bad happens, they can run you through the ringer if they want to, and you could be exposed live from a liability standpoint. Keep that in mind. Have a phenomenal operating agreement that says, if someone breaches fiduciary duties, this is what happens. If someone wants out of the business, this is what happens. If someone dies, this is what happens. If the business needs more money, this is what happens. And I could go on with a hundred more. Guys, one of my companies currently has an operating agreement with one partner that is literally 40 something pages long. Isn't that crazy? You're like, well, nothing will ever happen. Well, what if it does? It, it, nothing ever happens until 50% of marriages and in divorce. That's a true fact. Nobody ever thinks anything's going to happen. But you're not going to listen to your accountant. You're definitely not going to listen to your attorney. You're not going to listen to your parents. You're not going to listen to your spouse. Listen to me. Hopefully. Make that operating agreement. Now, when you have these four, here's the great news. When you have these four in the binder, you can now walk into any bank you want and say, hey, I want to open a business bank account. And you can literally just put the binder on the desk and they have everything they need in order to do it other than your ID, like your proof of identification. That's it. That's how cool this is. So this binder, anytime a potential business partnership, anytime bank accounts, anytime contracts, you bring the binder and everything's in there. I don't know why, but organization just keeps me sane. Maybe I'm a little bit OCD, but I love doing that. And then the last thing you add now that you've added the bank account is the bank account information. And listen, sometimes you don't really have like a nice clean sheet of bank account information. But for me, what that is, is name of bank, address of bank, um, routing number, account number, all of that. And then that way I've just got it. Oh, somebody wants to send me a wire. I need to send this, that, and the third. I can open it up. Oh, um, you know, this happened to me two weeks ago. My accountant for one of the other LLCs that I have shot me an email and she was like, hey, uh, what's the EIN for that one? What did I do? What do you think I did? I just went and grabbed my binder, look, looked at it and typed it in, sent her an email. It took me two seconds. Organization is key in your business. Okay, now it gets a little bit juicier. Now to the bank accounts. Now here is where I'm going to step on even more toes because I'm talking about what I used to do. But how many of you guys that own an LLC right now feel like you might be maybe doing something wrong because you just haven't been taught yet how to manage the money in a bank account? Anybody? Now, here's the thing. What I'm about to tell you is just my opinion. There will be attorneys and accountants that will differ from my opinion. Does everybody understand that? I am teaching you what I've learned and what I've paid for. Feel free to write it down and share it with your accountant or attorney, and then maybe the ideas will bounce off each other and you guys come up with something that works for you. So business bank account structure. We're going to start by assuming we're going to start by assuming we are just one LLC, okay? Let's assume you own one LLC. You own one limited liability company. That is it. Right there is that account. Does anybody know if I go in and I start PK Enterprises, 
with my binder and I walk in and I start a checking account, that's the account that the money's going to come into and I'm going to be spending the money as well out of it. Does anybody know what the most common term for that account would be? Not checking. It is a checking. What's the most common term for that account? Just curious what you guys would call it. Pass through, expense account. By the way, there's literally no right or wrong name. You have to name it something though. So in this case, I'm going to name it. It's definitely not a personal account, Charlie. This is a business bank account. If that's your personal account, you're going to use it for personal expenses. We'll talk about it. You're screwed if you ever get sued. Bye bye. So that is what I would call an operation account, an operating account. That is an account that we're in the juice now, I'm trying to change the color of my pen. Give me a minute. This is the account that the money comes into. Okay. And Jennifer, uh, we're not there yet. Don't worry, I got you. So that's your money, right? So you make sales, this is revenue. Everybody understand so far? That's that business checking account. So it's not your personal bank account, it's your business's bank account. The money comes in. Okay, and then what happens with that money? The money goes out, right? Marketing. I don't even want to try to write right now. What is another expense that your business could, could have? Name another one. Meals, commissions, payroll, rent, travel, salaries, taxes, insurance. Ethan Bowen, I'm not going to pick on you, but I am. Ethan Bowen just said taxes. Can you guess what the second account in my structure is? My tax account. So what happens here is my money comes in my operations account. I've got this one checking account. I'm calling it an operations account. That's where the money comes in for this business. But then when that money comes in, and by the way, when you think business, guys, just for those that are a little bit more beginner here, I don't want you to think about this in terms of like you own this massive like manufacturing business. You might be a network marketing professional, a real estate agent, insurance agent, solar agent. You can set up an LLC so that when you try to go and grow your business, real estate, you want to take that client out, you can write off that interaction. That's what this is mainly for, these 1099. So th these are sales commissions in most of your cases, right? But when that $10,000 commission comes in, is it taxed yet? No, it's not. There's no withholdings. So that means that 10,000 that came in is still subject to federal and state, to keep it simple, just talk about federal and state income taxes here in the US. And of course, if you're abroad, any taxes that you guys have as well. And so what I start with guys, at the bare bones minimum is I, and this is again, really for you guys that are getting commissions from selling something, but I start by putting 30% at minimum into a tax account right away. So if $10,000 in income, we'll say for this example, was the income here. And let's say between meals and marketing, which is traditionally for a lot of you guys, your biggest expenses, especially if you're selling real estate or insurance. Let's say that's a thousand bucks for the month. Okay. Then 30% or 3000 goes over here. Now, there's a specific strategy that I use for this. This does not necessarily mean that it is under the same bank. What do I mean by that? This operating account could be at Chase, and this one could be at Bank of America. 
Now, what I do is I put my tax account. Can anybody guess where you think I hold this? I have my tax account in a high yield savings account. You know, Ally Bank, somebody mentioned, that's an example of an online bank that's currently yielding over 4% on your money. And so when I am saving for my taxes, I like to put it in a high yield savings. And again, when I'm mentioning the name of banks, like that doesn't matter. That's preference. Like earlier, I mentioned my Morgan Stanley kind of runs my world, pretty much does. But that's preference. Somebody in here might like Ally. Some of you guys might like Bank of America. Some of you guys might like the local credit union. The point is, you have one checking account that is for operations. All the money that comes in goes in that account. All your expenses come out of that account. And then you send the tax money to a high yield savings. Now, here's the little information that I wish 18 year old Patrick was taught. Like when I was taught some of this, I didn't know how this worked. Well, how do I do that? How does the transfer work? Guys, don't overcomplicate it. If it's in the same bank account, like let's say I'm in Chase and I have a savings and a checking, it's literally an internal transfer. That's it. Don't overcomplicate it. If uh, if this is an ally and this is in Chase, this is just an ACH away. Don't overcomplicate it. This is not like some Houdini stuff. It is simply a transfer. The money is still your money. It didn't go anywhere. You're saving. You could do anything as long as there's a paper trail. Don't take it out in cash. You could technically do it though, as long as there's a paper trail, but just transfer it. Okay, we're not done though. Now that we're saving for taxes, and I'm doing a very simple, simple version that I think is gonna be most effective for you guys today. Keep in mind, every topic today that you learned is a two to three hour masterclass on, it own, on its own. The net, there's another account, okay? What do you guys think the next account that is linked to this would be? And some of you are gonna get it wrong. It's all good. There's no specific order. We don't have an expense account. We already spent expenses. It's our personal account. Yeah. Somebody said, pay yourself. How many of you guys want to get paid? Now, keep in mind that there is a buffer here. Okay. This buffer in this red box means that, oops, I got to go back, guys. Sorry. This buffer means that this is a personal account. This is not a business bank account. This is you. This is Patrick Kenny's checking, right? This is not PK Enterprises. These two are PK Enterprises. This is me. Every single one of you has a bank account, right? That's this account. Okay. And what that means is I pay myself. Where is my drawing tool? There we go. I pay myself out of my operation account, let's say 5,000 bucks. So now I send that 5,000 here. Now, I know that somebody in here is thinking, ah, oh, now he's gonna go the S Corp lane. That's for the next masterclass. I'm not gonna go down the S Corp lane. But this, and by the way, yes, I have an S Corp, if you're wondering, for those more advanced guys. So for you advanced guys, this is an S Corp. This is payroll. But for those of you guys that are just having an LLC to start, what do they call this? They call this an owner's draw is the, the accounting term. They call this a draw. And all you're doing, again, quit with the big language. This is simply, again, a transfer. That's all this is. So this is me transferring money from my operation account to my personal account. Now I'm going to stop for a minute. Now I'm going to have a disclaimer. And I said that I was going to probably expose some people. There are people on this call right now that currently in their operation account, when they go out to eat, 
with their friends that's not business related, they use their operation account. When they pay rent every month, they use their operation account. When they pay insurance, they use their operation account. When they do anything, they travel, they do anything that's not business related, they use their operation account. What they don't do is they don't set aside money and transfer it over here. This operations account is only used for business. Anybody care to share if I just exposed you? Put a one in the chat. Here is why I say this. Listen, I'm not constantly paranoid of lawsuits, but I like protection. When you treat your business account like yourself, meaning I have a business account and I just do life with it. If you were to get sued, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, for any reason, a good attorney will look at that and say, wait a minute. His business is him personally. Him and his business are one and another. And they have this thing called the corporate veil. The reason you have a limited liability company is protection. Meaning if you did something that got you sued in your business, they couldn't sue you personally because you've separated the two by literally, by literally, by literally transferring the money to yourself and only spending out of the operation account business expenses and only spending personal expenses out of the personal account. But too many people convolute this. And now you get in a lawsuit and they say, wait, they're the same person because they don't have a personal account. They don't use a personal account. They only use their business account and bam, all of your personal assets are now at risk. Hopefully this call starts to become more worthful or more worth the free price tag here with just that one little sentence. This, by the way, is what I used to do on an old LLC that's now dissolved. I realized once I got in the room with a good attorney, he was like, dude, if you ever gotten something, you're done. All your personal assets, your cars, your bank accounts, your investments, anything under your name, on a good lawyer, say bye-bye. When you do this, when you separate, guess what? They can only come in here. All your personal investments, your personal house, your personal car, none of that is at risk because it's shielded over here because you've you've literally, all you've done is transfer. Guys, ACH, wire, check, Zelle, that's it. Now, never move money that you're going to go back and forth. Don't do that. So only move the money that you know your business doesn't need to survive. And try to pay yourself a consistent amount every single month. And once you get good enough, okay, once you get good enough, here is what I would suggest. I would suggest talking with your account about becoming an S-Corp. That way you become your company's own employee. Patrick Kenny is employed by my own company. I get a paycheck like all of you guys. Uh, the math boils down, if you're wondering, to saving you about $7,000 per $100,000 in federal tax. Maybe a little off per state, but around there. This is very applicable to freelancers, extremely. But I would not really look deeply in considering what I just mentioned in the S-Corp route unless you're doing about hundred grand a year or more. Until that point, what I'm showing you right now is perfect. Now, from here, what other accounts do you think I've got? I've got a savings account personally, an investing account personally. So now what I've got is I've got all my personal expenses, rent, and maybe a car. By the way, you could have a car out of here or out of here. Depends on what the car is used for. I've got two cars. I've got one personal car and I've got one business car. The personal car, we're getting into the weeds now. The personal car, um, I don't pay because I paid for it cash. So I don't pay. I have to put personal insurance, blah, blah. The business car that I use for business purposes, anything I pay for is out of this account. Do you see the difference? Okay. Now, this is my personal investing. Meaning if you chose, say, 10%, right? 
then that would mean that $500 would go to, say, the investing side. Now, remember, this account, I call it saving slash investing because what did we learn like an hour ago? I said, we save money to go on offense later, right? That's all we're doing. So you're saving that money until you're ready to go. So that might be 10%. Notice that's not 10% of what you made here. That's 10% of what you transferred here. And again, that's an arbitrary number. Some of you would be higher or lower. Now, could you, somebody asked, could you have another one of these bubbles right off operation where you have a savings and investing bubble for your LLC? Absolutely. And yes, this, by the way, is high yield as well. So I have two high yields. That's it. Now, what you've just done, guys, is you've protected. And I'm, I'm showing you guys this version. By the way, is this valuable? We're not done, but is this valuable? That one protection piece should help you. This is protected. So this, think about all of this as business. And think about all of this as, yeah, that's yellow. That's not going to be shown right there. All this is personal. That's it. But again, the mistake that I made, and I saw a question, Ally Bank is an example. Apple's an example. Not Apple, excuse me. Um, oh man, what is it called? Goldman's an, an example. Whatever, just go search high yield savings account. Make sure it's FDIC insured. The mistake that I made when I first started, and somebody said, you made the mistake, how did you correct it? I saw your question. So I'm going to answer that now. I made the mistake when I first started of doing that, where basically all the money would come in my operation for my business and I would do all my business expenses as well as all of my personal out of that one account. Somebody said, how did you correct it? What I literally did is I made a brand new corporate structure. I dissolved the old entity. And I no longer do that that way. I no longer do business that way. That's it. Is that a couple year transition? Yes. But when I did it, I just made a decision. And guess what? You guys are in a really good time right now, aren't you? Because you could say, you know what? I'm going to make the decision that starting in, in January, I'm going to have an entirely new corporate structure. Now, this has nothing to do with corporate structure, by the way. This is just one bank account. So if you have multiple LLCs, by the way, do you need multiple bank accounts? 100%. You do this over and over and over and over and over for every account. So let's keep moving on because I want to get into some more of this really deep stuff. Oh boy. Here we go. Who's ready? Who wants protection in their life from liability legally? Lawsuits. I just showed it to you. Was that not enough? Who wants more protection? Fun fact for you guys, you saw in just that picture, you saw three companies of mine, but I only own one LLC. I only own one company. How does that happen? Here we go. I own a holding company from Delaware. Now, my, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit something to some of you guys that are maybe a little bit adv more advanced and you understand all this a little bit faster than the rest. So I'm going to go off shift for a minute to tell you, my attorney, we went through my information, suggested this, did not suggest a trust for what I was trying to accomplish. I just want to put that out there so that if some of you guys are thinking about a trust in some way, keep in mind that it was just my attorney's opinion and I really trust him. I own a holding company from Delaware. Again, I'm not saying you don't have to have a truck. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that was his suggestion to me. So I, I just, again, this is all the stories of me. This is me. Why Delaware? Number one, fast legal resolutions. Simply put, they use a board of peers, not a jury to make legal decisions. They use people that have actually been in business to make settlements and agreements in the court of law versus in Arizona, for instance, what do they use? A jury of people that probably have never owned a business and don't understand the nuances. So if you ever got in a lawsuit and it got to a trial, 
it helps. And yes, Nike, where do they own? Where's their main headquarters at? Look it up. And the list will go on, by the way. Start looking up notable companies that own. Go look up notable companies that own a Delaware entity. Go look that up. Google, Amazon, CVS, CNBC, you name it. Over 60% of Fortune 500 companies are out of Delaware. Number two, I love it because it's so flexible. You can tailor your corporate structure to whatever you need. But the big one, number three, they can't find you, baby. Who the hell owns it? You see, if I were to go to Arizona, that's where I'm from, Corporate Commission website right now, and I were to type in, and you're from Arizona, and you own an LLC as a principal, as your name on there, and I were to type in your name, you would pop up. Your address would pop up. Voila. Now I know who owns that thing. We'll talk about what that looks like in a minute. So you can't do that in Delaware. There is no searchable thing. And in order to really get down to it, if they can, you got to pay an attorney thousands and thousands of dollars just to see who owns it. Now there is a federal, Robert Robles just mentioned this, there is a federal privacy that's 2024 is the, when you have to start filing it, basically disclosure. It'll start in 2025, where they actually, you have to disclose it. But that will not change some of these protection policies. I already talked to my attorney about it. Basically, what it makes is it makes it easier for sort of the overarching entities of our world to find. But you and I, it's still going to be a little bit harder. Like, I'm not going to be able to find you as easy still. It's still going to cost more. And yes, disclose the owner. Number four, tax. There's no sales tax and no tax on out-of-state income. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't pay any taxes. I still pay Arizona tax and still pay federal tax. But the point is, because I'm generating revenue, they're not killing me because I'm not in Delaware. Meaning I don't have to pay Delaware, even though my holding company is in Delaware. Does that make sense? I'm paying in the state that I'm in. And number five, it's easy to set up. It's, it's, it's fast. You can get it done quick on websites, with an attorney, you name it. So here is such a valuable slide. You want to see how rookies do it? How do rookies structure their LLC? All their business income into one LLC. They do pest control. They do real estate investing. They have a real estate license. They have a rental property. They do solar. They do network marketing. And they put all of their income into one LLC. Anybody in here that currently does that? I'm going to show you an example. And I'm about to share with you something that is not going to be certainly won't be pertinent to all of you. Imagine that you own a rental. Any of you own a rental property? Imagine you own a rental and it's under ABC rental. You wouldn't usually call it that, but ABC LLC, doesn't matter. Imagine you own that and then you, um, you um, I don't know, you sell something. What do you guys want to sell? You also sell solar or real estate doesn't matter okay watch this barbara's her name right barbara's 64 and i got a rental in montana she pays me 900 dollars a month and i hired a um snow shoveling company for 20 bucks a time to to shovel the snow up in montana Barbara walks out to get her mail the other day and they didn't come yet and she slips on the ice, hits her head. Her son's an attorney. 
they look up the owner of the property and they say they see ABC LLC. Okay, I personally am protected as long as my um, I'm, I'm transferring money from from operation account. You guys just learned that to personal. Personally, I'm protected. But here's the challenge here. Imagine this account, all this money coming in, real estate, solar, blah, blah. This, this, this account has money in it. This account might have investments. This account might own a car. What's at risk now? All of it. Everything. That's how rookies do it. If you're doing this like this, if you're doing this like this and you're spending personal expenses out of this one LLC, you're a super rookie. But this is how rookies are doing it. All their money. And guess what? You're liable as hell. It's a massive risk. Now, the reason I'm sharing this, guys, is I'm showing you from experience. I was a rookie. All of it, using it for personal, all income into one entity. Guys, same thing. Oh, boy, was I a rookie. But that's okay. We're all rookies at some point, right? Every NFL player was a rookie at some point. We just got to learn and then change and actually implement this information. So that's how rookies do it. Now, here's how some do it. I didn't put the smiley face on last one, but you can assume that the smiley face owned that one LLC, right? Here's how some do it. Here's you, and you own all these LLCs. Now, that might seem like a bunch. You might only have one. You might only have two, but I'm just showing for dramatic effect. That's the rental one. So you own the LL or you own the rental under the LLC. Tons of people do it by just literally the address. So if it's on, you know, Thomas Avenue, then it's 647 Thomas Avenue LLC. That's what they typically do. Okay. So, oops. This is one LLC. Think about that green line as like protection, right? And as long as this has its own what? Operating account. And then you're transferring to yourself what, what is here. There's a little bit of like this shield. And then there's your solar gig. And there's your separation. And then maybe, um, maybe you've got a gift basket business. Hopefully, do you guys get the drift? Do I need to keep writing out the different LLCs? Just ran, I'm, this is all random. True story, Ethan. Had a guy call me last week. JC, I don't know if he's on here. Literally called me, where do I wire you the money? I need to learn from you. So funny. Okay, so all these LLCs are different purpose. That way, if she falls... This one's not impacted because it has nothing to do with it. And I don't convolute the funds. This one's not impacted. This one's not impacted. By the way, it's about to get good, Paul. This one's not impacted. And then I'm wiring it. I'm wiring it. I'm wiring it. And I'm giving myself a shield from liability. I'm giving myself a shield from liability. But upon really everything, there's always one good attorney away from screwing you over to say, look, he didn't manage this correctly. Now they can go after you. There's still some risk here. Even though you're protecting yourself, always remember there's still some risk. That's the risk of doing business. In the US, you can sue anybody for anything. Now, to answer your bookkeeping question, right now, just to give you an example, for multiple LLCs, all of the bookkeeping, all of the payroll, all of the tax, I pay $750 a month. That's what I pay to get everything done. I just pay per month. She does everything. She files it. She does the bookkeeping, everything. And every LLC is done here in Arizona. I don't know if she does people outside of Arizona. She's in North Scottsdale. Okay, so 
the next part is where things really crank up. This is now how I do it. And I learned this over time. I, Patrick Henney, own a holding company. That is the only company that I own. Where is it at, by the way, guys? If you learned anything, where is it at? It's in Delaware. I own a holding company in Delaware. And that holding company does what? Owns my LLCs. Uh, no, she, she won't, Jennifer. There it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. And so what just happened, guys, was if you're doing everything correctly, you've got a shield here. You've got a shield here. You've got a shield here. Rental, sales, pottery business, like you get the drift. You've separated them. So now there's a shield. If they're really good, they got to be really good. They could get up to your holding company. They get up to your holding company. If, you're, if your accountants are really good, the holding company's broke. It's got nothing. There's really no value to it. It's a dead end. And there's another whole protection barrier here because this is its own entity. This is its own entity. This one, this one, this one. Guys, was I making a false claim by saying that this call should be charged thousands of dollars to be here? I spent, God knows, 20 something thousand dollars for this right here. Now, I'm gonna show you two variations on drawing. I don't have the slides for them. I just wanna share two more variations. Variation number one that I've seen done, in fact, is that this isn't you, but this is another holding. So a holding owns a holding that owns the LLCs. So there's another, I've seen that done. In fact, I talked about it with the attorney. We talked about doing it, but we didn't think I was at that big of a, a need. That's a big need for people that own a lot of property with, with LLC names on it and stuff like that. Because you do not want a tenant to figure out who you are. You know, you just don't. The other option that I've seen is this. It's not a holding. It's a trust. That is a different option that I've seen that owns the holding. But for intensive purposes, I've shown you that. Okay. Now, what do you guys think? Turn my webcam on. How did I do? We're not done yet, but how did I do? How many of you guys feel like this is the point where now I'm like, there's endless proof. And this is where I would probably start the webinar where I'd sell you something. I keep my promise. I got no coaching program. I have no mentorship. This is me just giving you as much as I possibly can. Okay. Now think about this as a uh, LLC is a limited liability company. Think about this as the overarching webinar to get your mind sparked. I wanted to do this because I really want to go in depth on topics in 2024, but I need enough people to see that I'm not bullshitting you and I'm saying I'm trying to give you the most value possible for free so that when I announce the next webinar, how many of you guys will join? That's what I want. So first of all, and we're not done. We've got, geez, we got another $100 worth of gift cards to give away. Lots to go here. Q&A hasn't even started. But before you guys go, I want two things from you. Number one, can you go to Instagram, go to pkennyfx, follow me, connect with me. pkennyfx is my Instagram. I'll share, I share tons of stuff there. That's the first thing. And number two, at the end of this call, you'll be emailed as well as there's gonna be a pop-up when I end this call for a survey. I can just kindly ask that you take the survey. It'll take you under 30 seconds. Okay, now here we go. With that said, I think probably could be one of the most valuable times is for questions. 
Don't put your questions in the chat. Put your questions in what's called the Q&A bubble. It's right there, the Q&A bubble. Okay, the Q&A bubble, I'm gonna click on. Let me get it to pop up. And I'm gonna answer a few questions. Uh, does the question pop up? Can you guys see the question I'm answering when I say uh, answer the question live? Uh, I don't know how it works. No. I click answer it live. All right, great. So Julie Peters asks, my parents want to know what happens to net worth should the market crash like what happened during the Great Depression? What do you guys think? What happens if you have exposure to the markets? And this is in the chat box. You can type yes or no. Yeah, net worth goes down. I wouldn't call yourself screwed because again, what is your odds of making money, Julie Peters, if you hold money for more than 12 years in the markets? 98%. And so keep in mind that that's part of this is that you have exposure and you always want to make sure that you're investing money that you cannot, you don't, you don't need. You want to invest money that you can afford to lose. And I got to tell you that the people that withdrew in COVID crash, the people that withdrew in 08 are the most recent two major crashes. What happened to them? They screwed themselves. Had they just held, because time in the market beats timing the market, people that try to get out, they're trying to time the market. Go read the book, book Unshakable. We address that in that book, or he addresses that. What high yield, and by the way, corrections create opportunity. So the market crashes, it creates opportunity. What high yield savings do I use? Ally Bank. I am with more than one network marketing company. Should each company be under its own LLC? Um, it would look what I would look at is how much money you are holding on to in each given company. And if it's a substantial amount in one account, then I would separate that liability out. Yes. If it's not uh, substantial is a relative term to you, I, I would keep it in one for ease of use and then transfer it out. How do you overcome setbacks? Interesting. Kind of a general question. You know, I think that there's two types of people. Person A gets hit with an obstacle and all they can think about is, um, you know, to complain, to sit on it, to dwell on it. Person B looks at it for what it is and tries to solve the problem. I think overcoming setbacks is actually more about solving problems. So, you know, you learn from it, you find the lesson in each thing and you just keep it moving. Uh, you got to understand at the end of the day, nobody is special here. We all are facing similar things in terms of the economy. And it's a, you know, it's a big, it's a big task to think that you're the only one going through whatever you're going through right now. Um, uh, Veronica, this is kind of a, this is kind of an interesting question. Um, for me, it's a lot less than you guys would probably think. It is. Um, sorry, I'm adding it up. Um, $66,500. So probably less than you thought. Can you spin again, please? Shana Reed says, I want the money. Who wants to spin again? Put a one in the chat box, not the Q&A bubble. Who wants to spin? Should we spin some? All right, let's spin. Let's spin again. In the Q&A bubble. As a newbie in the stock market, first steps to get rolling. I would get information. I would start learning about putting money aside. Then I would get a brokerage account. Then I would start adding. I, I just showed you guys today the statistics of if you just put the money in the market 
any hundred dollar hundred dollars counts. No, I do not have a trust. Nope. Uh, I think that's preferential. I, I have plenty of real estate folks that I know that have S corps. Okay. Yes, I would change. I would separate your personal commissions from the actual company. How much money should I have slash be making? It's not about be making, it's a percentage. So it doesn't matter. The point is you should start investing 10% of your income, 5% of your income, 25% of your income, whatever that is. Um, they call it like a group of chancellors. So it's not a traditional jury of people. It's actually just a group. Of, you have to look it up the term that they use, but it's like a group of chancellors. All right. Last question. Is this recorded? I took notes, but need to listen over and over. Yes, it'll take a while to render. It is recorded. Also on my YouTube, if you search my name, Patrick Kenny, I have a YouTube channel documenting real estate flips, documenting um, investments, documenting everything. I share my journey on there very transparently. And um, on that channel, over the next two months, I will be posting snippets of this call. Actually, I recorded, pre-recorded it, so it'll be different than this one. You might get something else out of it. Guys, once again, thank you guys all for coming. Have a great new year. I hope that this was as valuable as I tried to make it seem on, um, on Instagram, on social media. Again, if you guys could tag me on your social medias, Please, I'm going to end this call right now. Stay on for literally five, anything for me. If you could pay me today, this is it. Please go and do the, uh, the, the survey. It's about to pop up on the screen, guys. God bless you guys. Happy New Year. Happy holidays. Hope you enjoyed. Hope I didn't waste your time. God bless.